Okay, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Andrew Trossman. Um, I am a distinguished engineer at IBM. Don't ask me what that means. Uh, all right. Well, so I hope uh, you're having fun here at the OpenStack <coughs> Summit. Uh, how many people? How many people recognize this T-shirt? Anybody recognize this one? Look familiar? It's from two years ago. Two years ago, there were only 800 people uh, at, at the OpenStack Summit, and it has come a long, long way. How many people, this is their first time at an OpenStack Summit? Well, welcome. Are you having fun? Yeah. All right, who's had fun? I didn't hear anything. Yeah. All right, all right, that's more like it. All right, well, so OpenStack is about having some fun, and it's also about, you know, code and stuff like that. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about um, uh, our Smart Cloud Orchestrator product. Uh, as Tammy, those of you were, who were in Tammy's presentation earlier, um, who ta uh, she talked about, um, uh, it's, it's called oh, Cloud Management uh, with OpenStack. Um, they just changed the name on us, so it's a little bit challenging. Even she made a an accidental slip and almost called it Smart Cloud Entry. Anyways, so Orchestrator includes the same code. We work with the same team. All the stuff that Tammy's team uh, develops is included in Smart Cloud Orchestrator. Uh, and then we add some additional ingredients that give you some additional capabilities. And I'll, I'll take you through what, what that's about. Uh, but to start with, I, I, I do like this um, chart that I've uh, uh, graciously stolen from, from some, some other folks uh, in the OpenStack community. I'm not sure who did it first, um, the folks from CERN or, or the folks from Cloud Scaling. Doesn't really matter. I think we all, we're all seeing this, is that, um, uh, you know, when you look at the... the clouds like Amazon that, that started out focusing on cattle style workloads, the whole idea of building reliable systems out of unreliable parts, it's wonderful. I'm big on it. I love it. It's fun. But we also have pets. We all have them. Um, and you know, it's, it's legacy. It's, it's what it is, right? We all have these systems. And so how do we, how do we manage both? Um, this, the guys at CERN are also big fans of helping to make OpenStack address both ends of the spectrum. And, and I think we're doing a good job within OpenStack. Um, uh, I think what OpenStack enables is at the infrastructure level that reality is uh, your pet workloads are going to have different infrastructure needs than your livestock workloads. And through a consistent API, you can make those choices. Um, uh, my simple example of that is when you're, when you're um, setting up a, um, a system, if you add an additional um, volume, so additional storage, you can choose, well, what class of service, what um, um, volume type, to use the uh, appropriate cinder term, do I need? And, and for pets, I'm going to give a different volume type than I would give to um, one of my livestock workloads. So I think OpenStack's done a great job of that, but there's more that we need to do. Because it's not just that our pets require different infrastructure, our pets also require different management policies. And so that's what we're trying to help um, our customers with. <laughs> Um, this is a high-level uh, picture of what um, Orchestrator is about. We've tried to make it a, a loosely coupled system um, that's easy to operate. Um, at the bottom, uh, no surprise, a lot of what Tammy showed you, it's an OpenStack implementation, um, OpenStack infrastructure. We have a variety of backends supported, um, ranging from, you know, uh, uh, VMware, KVM, et cetera, um, the Power and, and Z platforms Tammy mentioned. We also uh, have support for um, providing an OpenStack interface to non-OpenStack clouds like 
like Amazon, for example. Because that's what we're trying to do is to enable um, an environment above this where you can build, uh, build your, your automation, build your additional um, systems for managing both pets and, work, and, and cattle workloads, um, but using a consistent API. The next sort of major piece up are the patterns, and this is about very much, how many people uh, have been in a heat session so far? Um, and, and people, all, have you all heard about Tosca? Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that when I get to the pattern section. Um, again, that's kind of a, we use the term um, workload orchestration. Uh, unfortunately, the word orchestrator is one of those that means lots and very little at the same time. So um, I, I personally try to, actually I have a little thing with my, my dev team. Whenever somebody says the word orchestration, I have to take a drink. So uh, fortunately, I don't have anything particularly strong here with me, so, but I will take a drink every time somebody utters that word. Um, so what uh, uh, we have above this, um, and I won't say the O word, uh, is, is really a workflow engine. It's based on our um, uh, uh, BPM um, product. It's truly a best in class for anybody who's used it. How many people out there use BPM in your organization? <coughs> awesome, great to see. Um, and so we'll talk about how you can use that to help you to manage the management policies for both pets and cattle. Um, we also have, you know, the, the typical self-service catalog. We have integration to development tools and as well service management tools. And I think that's really uh, where, particularly when we start talking about running pets in the cloud, it's about the, the integration with all of those management tools, whether it's your monitoring, your backup, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so any questions so far? Anybody just want to belt them out? If, you, if I come across, I say something stupid, just yell it out, and uh, um, we're happy to, to deal with some questions. What's the scope of ownership tend to be? Known, applied, availability known, the universe? Uh, okay, so um, at, at the, the low level of the infrastructure, so we, we've, um, we do, so OpenStack supports a variety of mechanisms, things um, like host aggregates, availability zones, um, regions, uh, and, and we do make uh, each of those available. Um, what we typically deal with, though, is at a region level. And um, now often what people will do is they'll create a, a, an availability zone and, and basically just wrap it as a region. And one of the reasons for that is, um, uh, and this is something that frankly isn't, doesn't really exist in OpenStack today, is um, the level of uh, access control across multiple regions. Um, so we, this is again a place where we put a little bit of additional IBM um, capability to help you to manage that. Um, uh, and uh, while at the same time we have folks, in fact one of the guys on my team is a core uh, developer for Keystone. So we're trying to get there. Um, I know uh, earlier they, they uh, talked about the Federation work. Um, I think they made it sound a little bit further ahead than it really is. But you know, this, is, um, this is one of those places where we try to close that gap. So to answer the question, we really generally manage it at the region level um, for, for those reasons. So let's talk a bit about the patterns. Um, well, as no surprise, um, IBM has been working on, on patterns for many, many years. In fact, uh, I think the first time, uh, so my company was acquired in 2003. And even at that time, we were working with uh, Microsoft. Um, Microsoft had an initiative called DSI. Anybody remember that one? where they had all white horse, and they had this cool tooling. And so we were trying to do the back-end provisioning. Well, Microsoft would do this you know, cool front-end tooling because at the end of the day, your non-trivial applications are combinations of multiple systems collaborating together. And how do you do that? And that's where 
complexity really starts to happen. Um, so as no surprise, IBM's invested many, many years into tools and technologies to help make that easier. Um, here's a screen cap from one of those tools. It's a drag and drop editor. And you may have seen um, Michael Elder did a, a, a pitch yesterday of one of the latest tools that, that we we're working on. Um, but frankly, more important than the tools themselves uh, is the content, right? Being able to pick up ready to use, out of the box patterns that I just, I download it and I start going click, 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 and away it goes. Um, it has, essentially, it encapsulates a lot of best practices around this. There are over 200 patterns out there um, that we have uh, available for uh, not only Smart Cloud Orchestrator, but a suite of our offerings. Um, how many people have heard of uh, um, pure application systems? Um, so it's the same technology, the same patterns that work across um, in fact, I think I have a chart that describes, no, it's a little later on, but essentially it's the same patterns that work on pure systems, the same patterns work on orchestrator, and the same patterns can work off-premise on, uh, on software. And obviously this is something that's, you know, when, when I get to a customer and the customer uh, is using some sophisticated software, maybe something like Cognos or, uh, um, uh, Lotus Connections, I mean, some of these are non-trivial and when they can go and download a package, a little pattern that makes it, that makes it simple, that's just I instant value. And even with all the fancy graphical drag and drop tools, you don't have to do all the work to assemble them. So this um, we, we find is, is extremely valuable. Uh, there are IBM provided patterns for IBM content, but we also have a bunch of partners who provide patterns for their stuff as well. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the next uh, layer up of the O word, which at the end of the day, it's, it's our BPM tool that's integrated with the rest of the system. And so that means we have integration to the pattern technologies, um, and we have integration to uh, the OpenStack APIs. Um, now, before I uh, get too much into this, I want to just take a step back and talk a little bit about um, the open source of, of patterns. Um, so as, as many of you know, um, in the uh, previous release cycle, so Havana, um, we introduced heat into OpenStack, um, which essentially it has been working on an, an alternate technology for doing patterns. And frankly, that's great. Um, we, we continue to support our IBM proprietary pattern engine because, as I said, there's a whole lot of valuable content out there. But what we want to do is we want to make because the value is in the content, it's really important to have an ecosystem standards for providing content and for people to be able to create content from one place and then consume it in another. And so <clears throat> um, a number of you, in fact, I think uh, I saw, there you are, Matt at the back, um, our, one of our Tosca es experts has been working in the Tosca community. And I think one of the greatest things in the last uh, six month stretch for Icehouse um, that uh, many of us are really proud about is that what we've been able to do <clears throat> is cross pollinate between the Tosca open standard community and the OpenStack Heat open source community on something called HOT. And <clears throat> this cross pollination so far, we're, we're trying to get towards complete convergence so far what we have is you know, collaboration between the two communities and um, we've, we've contributed into Icehouse an import tool. So you can import uh, Tosca um, patterns and pull them right into um, what's called HOT, um, heat orchestration templates. Oh, I said, oh. Um, and again, the, the goal here is really about ubiquity 
um, so that we can have an, an ecosystem of content providers and content consumers. <clears throat> so this, uh, this coming summer, uh, we are putting out our next release of, of Smart Cloud Orchestrator. Uh, the release version is, is 2.4. And, um, and of course, it includes, includes Ice House, which includes um, Heat. Uh, and as I mentioned, it includes this Tosca importer. Uh, interestingly enough, we already had support for Tosca in, in the proprietary engine. But again, this just shows how um, you know, we're, we're really, it's all about the content, but we're um, absolutely embracing the, the open standards and the open source implementations. So we have consistent use across, um, across these environments. So why do we need orchestration? Um, uh, this is an example. In fact, it's, it's, it's taken from a, a customer. I, I don't even know who it was. Uh, but it kind of showed, you know, these are all the business processes that we have to put around all the stuff that we do. Now, admittedly, this is much more typical of what you see in uh, production pet style workloads than you would in, say, um, uh, livestock style workloads. But like I said, we all have to deal with these. So um, one of the things that we've tried to enable, in fact, what we found is um, that there, there are kind of two classes of um, why I need to do uh, workflow or runbook style automation. So one is, um, it's more about the business process around IT. I mean, reality is, how many people here are from a regulated uh, organization? <laughs> I'm sure there are a lot of hands here. And some of them, you probably can't. How many people can't put up their hand because you're not allowed? Anyways. <laughs> Uh, some of you, you know what, if you ever do go on to, to the website and you look at some of the past um, presentations, um, great guy, uh, um, um, uh, name's slipping me, um, Nate, uh, Nate from, um, uh, Nate Burton from the NSA, uh, did a great pre presentation, he did one of the keynote talks, was that in uh, Hong Kong or was it? One before, it might have been Portland. I think it was Portland. Um, anyway, so uh, uh, he wouldn't be able to put up his hand. But uh, I think you understand the, the, the point. And, and when it comes to, um, to that, it's, it's not just the, the business processes that you need to automate and, of course, um, audit against. Uh, but it's also, uh, you know what? We have organizations, we have people in place that use uh, monitoring tools and they have knocks and they have processes for dealing with problems. They have trouble ticket desks. They have um, you know, backup and restore processes and technologies. We have to integrate our stuff with that. Um, and OpenStack does a great job um, for uh, you know, giving us ubiquitous programmatic access to lots of infrastructure, but it doesn't help me with this problem. And that's the kind of thing that we use workflow automation to do. One of the things that we're working um, on is making it uh, easy so that we can decouple your heat template that defines here's the thing that I need to stand up from the management policy or the, the, the integration that you need to do. Because when I deploy it in a test environment, I don't need the same rigor and management integration as I do when I deploy into production. And we're trying to make those uh, workflows as reusable as possible. Um, I, I didn't really mention much about this, but one of the things that we have, aside from downloading patterns as reusable content in our marketplace, we have reusable workflows. Not just the workflows, but one of the things, um, the terminology we use are, are called toolkits. And these are little integration modules that know how to talk to various technologies. And we have things ranging from you know, talking to uh, network and storage devices um, uh, to uh, um, management tools, um, to development tools like Urban Code. How many people have heard of Urban Code Deploy? Um, excellent tool for, for operating a DevOps style um, uh, discipline. 
Um, and, and so we have a lot of these that you can go and download um, and then use uh, out of the box. Um, and, and that, of course, is also a, a, a really great way for our development teams to release additional functionality outside of the more typical, uh, you know, um, long release cycles. Uh, and so here is a screen cap of um, the, the workloads, uh, the workload um, automation. And um, so this is a screen cap from the tool. Uh, so this is a, the BPM tool that I mentioned that's integrated. Um, and over here on the, the left hand side, you can see that palette of, of toolkits. Which again, you know, those things are, you can download them, add them into your, your, uh, your palette as you need them. Um, and then uh, you can graphically create these things. Now, uh, these workflows, um, in fact, uh, you know, a lot of times you can just go and um, customize those workflows. So if you downloaded one, you could come in and in this bottom pane, you can make some little customizations. Many of them allow you to, to script them right there. Um, and, uh, but I also want to point out for those of you who aren't familiar with the tool is it also lets you uh, easily build user interfaces. Um, also drag and drop, really simple tooling uh, because sometimes uh, these, these business processes require interaction with humans. I know we try to avoid it and I don't like humans because I'm a techie nerd just like many of you. but we still have to deal with humans even if we don't like them. Um, and so this is a great way to, you know, very quickly string together um, some, some interfaces um, that instantly appear within your environment. And so I'll show you, uh, um, so here's the example where you know, so you've gone off, you, you've got a pattern, maybe you downloaded it, maybe you created a new one specifically to your, your application, um, and then you can uh, present this in our service catalog, uh, which is kind of a self-service interface um, that you can make available to your users. You can control um, which users see what kinds of capabilities that they're made available to. Um, very easy to go in and create service catalogs like this. And behind each one of these things is a BPM workflow. And usually what happens is the first part of that workflow is going to be a little bit of UI that is specific. Maybe I got to ca capture a little bit of information from the user before we go off and do it. And so here's an example where you click on that and all of a sudden, um, you know, that same uh, user interface that I sh just showed you how you did it using the tool appears um, and, and asks a few questions, you know, uh, what port do you want to run this thing on, and so on and so forth. Um, all right, uh, just gonna um, take a moment to, anybody want to see a, a demonstration? All right, let's, let's have a look. So this is available on U, uh, YouTube. Um, hopefully it'll start looking a little bit clearer because even with my glasses is pretty now there we go okay <laughs> um, so uh, we're, we're just going to take a, an example where we're trying to um, associate management policies with a, a pet style workload. And, and in this particular pet, we're, gonna, we're, we're using a DB2 database. Um, and, and so there's a, you know, simple, just enter in a little bit of information, what it is that you're trying to do. Um, kind of the usual things. Um, Uh, and it's a bit of a wizard thing, so it, you know, you, here we're going to pick uh, that we want to use DB2, um, and 
And now it's going to give us some, um, uh, you know, what, uh, what flavor, of course, open stack flavor. Um, but what we're going to have next is um, the different management things, literally as checkboxes. Do you want monitoring included in this? Uh, do you want backup and restore included in this? Do you want big fix security um, compliance? Um, and you select the ones you want and instantly they're available to you. Now, obviously, you had to do some integration in the back. Um, if, for example, you're using um, IBM's big fix now called IEM, well, you go to the marketplace, you download the, um, the, the content pack that does that integration and of course that's great, nice and out of the box. How many people use something other than big fix? This is part of where, so if you're using something else, this, this might be one place where you have to build your own workflow to support your technology or uh, if it's a third party vendor, um, that vendor may also uh, have a pack available. Um, and well, so the rest of this uh, it goes through, you know, um, entering the, the details of IP addresses and things like that. But essentially what happens behind the scenes is this, while OpenStack is doing the basic deployment of that DB2 database and, you know, associating the, uh, uh, um, the storage volume and all, the, all that good stuff that OpenStack does, behind the scenes we're going and making sure that we're integrating with your monitoring integrating with your backup and restore uh, systems and processes so that all those systems that are in place for the rest of your pet workloads continue to work exactly as, as they have. And, well, this is, uh, <laughs> I, I, hopefully this is, uh, looks pretty simple um, as a simple way to expose it. We're trying to make this easier um, each, with each release of our product. Um, in fact, uh, uh, one of the ones that um, we're trying to do is um, make this a, a available to, uh, um, you know, all through uh, the standard OpenStack Heat APIs. So behind the scenes, you can make that available to your users. As far as your users know, they have full unfettered access to OpenStack compatible clouds but you still have the control to be able to go and apply the, the management policies that you need to by, by region by region. You know, you may have a region that you define as being for, um, for different purposes. In fact, I was talking with um, uh, some of the guys um, from CERN. What they'll, one of the management policies that they do is uh, whenever they deploy a Windows VM, it goes on to a Hyper-V hypervisor. Of course, there are licensing reasons for why that is useful, whereas on the Linux side, that's going to end up on a KVM host, again, for licensing purposes. Um, any questions about this? Uh, please. Absolutely. So APIs, um, uh, let me just go back to chartware um, for a moment. So the API at the bottom level obviously is, is OpenStack, it's standard OpenStack APIs, nothing new, nothing special. Um, the patterns, I mentioned that we have a proprietary pattern engine and yeah, that has, it's a proprietary API to that but it, we do have it available. We have um, uh, toolkits for the workflow component so it can talk directly to that. Um, with this new release that includes heat, you can use the heat API at that level. Um, now, when you move up to that workflow layer, there are some other standards. Um, they're not part of OpenStack yet, um, but they're standards like BPEL um, and BPMN, uh, and, and again, our tool supports that as well. Um, there are some emerging efforts in the OpenStack arena, but it's very, very early on. Um, and again, as, as part of trying to maintain standards and um, you know, we'll certainly be working within uh, the community to make sure that we're as, as close to the standards as possible. Uh, 
sorry, with Congress? Uh, I, I, yeah, I read a little bit about Congress. Any, anybody in the room know about Congress? And I don't mean the, <laughs> yeah, I, I remember reading about it. it. It seemed like it was pretty early. Um, so anybody who goes to, to StackForge, anybody been to the StackForge web, web page? If you haven't, you should. Um, it's a great place to see some of the new things going on. Actually, the one that I was thinking about was, was Mistral, which is also very early. Um, but, you know, it, as, as this stuff evolves, we're trying to, uh, you know, work within the communities to make sure these things are available. Of course, in the meantime, you know, we do have standards around like things like BPL and BPMN uh, that you can use today. You mentioned that you're bringing support for heat. Yeah. Uh, so what, what does that, that mean? If I bring along a template, will that instantiate into your pattern dependent somehow? Or? Right. So, so um, how does our heat support look in, in our 2.4 release that's coming out? Actually, I'm going to, geez, this light just drives me nuts. Um, I, I'm going to take a, a moment to tell you a little bit about um, something I'm really, really pleased about. How many people have heard of Triple O? Um, so, we think it's a great idea. In fact, um, one of our technologies that uh, uh, we built and chose to contribute to OpenStack, when did we do this? 2009, 10-ish. Um, we, we had the same technique um, of the cloud built on the, on the cloud. Um, and, and so actually, with our, our uh, deployment, uh, when you install uh, the next release of Smart Cloud Orchestrator, it actually uses heat um, for the, uh, for the overcloud. Um, so we're very happy about that. It's a great way for us to deploy the components of, um, of SCO itself. Um, and Tammy showed you a little bit about the Horizon UI. And just as um, uh, Tammy showed the, some of the extensions for uh, the platform resource scheduler, we also have extensions for um, our own deployment of uh, the components of OpenStack. So we're, we're using it within our installer, that's okay. Um, in terms of the next layer up, it really is, it's kind of a peer to this. So right now, if you're, they're deployed separately. So if you have um, a, a pattern for the um, proprietary engine, it goes through the proprietary engine. If you have a pattern for um, for heat, it goes through heat. They're, it's all visible at the same at the um, the same OpenStack level, um, but you know otherwise they're they don't have today visibility to each, each other. This is obviously something that we're working on. Um, obviously, we want uh, to include um, heat uh, and within our, our own um, our own engine, uh, but it takes time. Um, in fact, uh, uh, at the same time this summer as we release the next version of Orchestrator, um, the, uh, the, the folks with um, uh, Pure Application Systems will also have both heat, uh, the heat engine as well as the proprietary engine. So again, you have the consistent um, uh, patterns, both kinds of patterns across uh, um, all the different infrastructures. And now let me just find that. Cute picture. So when you think about going on-premise, <laughs> off-premise, pure systems, orchestrator. Oh, I have to drink. That's why I usually say SCO. Um, but so SCO can integrate across these environments. In fact, that. That's been a, a really valuable um, uh, solution for a lot of our peer systems customers. Um, and, and again, I think that it's that consistency, whether it's the proprietary patterns or the, the new uh, heat patterns, um, whether you're using Tosca and converting them into hot or, uh, again, we're trying to make it available on all these platforms. Will uh, Actually, that there, there are a number of, um, in fact, if you go to the, there is a YouTube video about that integration. 
Um, that's a common one. Uh, one of the ones, um, uh, how many people went to the, the Pulse, IBM's Pulse? Um, so it's a conference we had in Vegas uh, uh, earlier in the year, it would have been late February. Um, uh, actually, I think one of our, um, one of our customers, the scenario they, they described was they wanted to use, they were using pure systems for their in-house production uh, but they were using um, using uh, uh, um, software uh, for development, and so they would use Orchestrator to manage the um, on-off premise uh, coordination. There are a number of other uh, variations and, and, and scenarios that people come up with, um, uh, and, and so some of that again, the integration packages um, are available on the on the marketplace that you can download and use. Any other questions? The open stack we're using, is it a fork is the question. The answer is no. Uh, it is, as, as Tammy told you, it's, it's um, standard open stack. Uh, the, the coming release is, is Icehouse. What's available today, um, uh, Smart Cloud Orchestra oh, version 2.3, is um, uh, with Grizzly. Um, now, how many people have used OpenStack with VMware? Grizzly, not very useful. And so for that, we, we have a proprietary driver that we use um, because, frankly, the communities wasn't good enough. Uh, in the meantime, we've got a number of folks, I don't know if they're in the room here today, but that have been working with the community to improve that driver. And I'm happy to say that our 2.4 release uh, is now switching over to the community driver. Because we had to make that investment to get the community driver to that state. Um, so it's not a fork. There are places where we've had to compensate. Um, like I said in the past with the, the VMware driver, um, we have a layer above that helps put some um, uh, um, uh, access control when you, when you start dealing with multiple regions, because unfortunately what's available today in the community really isn't quite there. Um, but again, we're working within the community on the one hand, on the other hand, um, we're making those additional capabilities. Uh, well, so um, Smart Cloud Orchestrator does include the, um, the, the, the open stack that Tammy mentioned about, um, but uh, you're, you're absolutely free to use others. We have uh, folks uh, in the room, in fact, um, that uh, uh, are using their own open stacks and, and we connect to them. Uh, in fact, uh, in our summer release, the 2.4 release, we're making that easier more flexible. Today it's a little bit uh, um, constrained, but it, 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 you can certainly do it. Uh, the problem is we, we f in the current release, you're f um, funneled through the EC2 APIs, which is a little bit annoying. Um, in our 2.4 <coughs> release, uh, well, that constraint's lifted. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, it's not. Oh, okay. Okay. So it seems to be that it's doing pretty much the same thing. So how does it differentiate with the macro? How do you differentiate? Well, honestly, that's that's not my job. <laughs> you know, there there are a lot of competitive products out there. Um, uh, personally. Um, I'm, uh, I'm very involved in our development, so I have to maintain arm's distance uh, uh, away from our competitors. Um, so I, I, I'm not gonna be able to give you the best answer. There are probably, um, I know I saw Rick uh, in the room. Is Matt in the room? Um, if you want, we can hook you up with some of the folks who, who that's their job. Any other questions? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
we've had KVM support since uh, the first release of it. Uh, and I believe I'm running out of time. Any other questions? Uh, so that's an interesting question. So Tosca um, started out, it was an XML uh, uh, format, um, still is, uh, but we've been working with the community on this. I don't, I don't know precisely the words, but a YAML based format. Um, so the interesting situation is that um, uh, the Smart Cloud orchestrator, oh, orchestrator that's in the field today um, actually supports the, the real, the full XML Tosca. But what, we're, what we do is we actually import it into our proprietary engine. Because you know, the, the standard doesn't give you an implementation, just the standard. So we do have the import that is available today. It's in the field. It's been there for a long time. Um, in the coming release, we actually have both. <laughs> Right, so we have, you can take the XML Tosca, pull it into the proprietary engine, or you could take the YAML, import it into the, and run it on the heat engine. Did I get that right, Matt? Yep, and they're, map, they're mappable to each other. So over time, they're going to map them and try to let them work. Yes, sir. All right, more questions. Okay, so I can bring my own OpenStack code, and you can manage it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, and then, so you're managing my OpenStack region. Can I also talk to it on the side and do work as well outside of it? Or do you own those resources? And I can't touch it from out your system unless I'm through your system. Uh, I. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is this is one of those, you know, can can you go around? Can you circumvent yourself? Yes, of course you can. Um, uh, the, the now, and this is actually one of the things. Sorry. Okay. Well, you want to give us an example? Sure. So I do Pets, I'm assuming. Where is the intelligence of that at the runtime? Maybe my application has intelligence saying, hey, I'm the one who needs to be in charge of my own future. I want to make certain requests that are outside the workflow. So it yep. has to talk back to the infrastructure. Yep. Totally cool. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the truth of the matter is, um, uh, I, I, I think um, systems that were designed for the cloud cattle style workloads, um, they were designed to exploit the APIs, right? Um, and those work really well. They don't need all the help and the hand holding that the pets do. And I think where a lot of this stuff really helps you to do is to run those pet workloads within the same environment. Um, so frankly, I think it's more for the pets that really need that kind of stuff. Now having said that, one of the things that um, uh, we, we've been seeing um, from a number of our customers is that uh, desire to basically hook into the APIs so that when somebody calls, just as an example, somebody goes and deploys a, uh, a heat template, um, we want to be able to allow him unfettered access to that API goes in and deploys this heat template, but we can trigger a workflow behind the scenes that says, wait a second, uh, we're gonna go and look at additional metadata maybe um, and make decisions. Um, maybe put up a few guardrails. Um, in fact, uh, uh, we have some folks that uh, like to apply logic to determine what region to deploy things, not just the um, authorization, but in fact the decision of when and where things should go. And that gives you an opportunity to do that. Um, some, and of course, depending on where you go, you may have different uh, guardrails. Um, again, this is, every customer seems to be going at this a little bit differently, but that seems to be a pretty common pattern um, that we've been seeing. Anybody else?
so the question was about what about uh, systems uh, uh, that have already been provisioned and I'm over time, I'm getting told to get the hell out of here. So I'm just going to say yes. <laughs> and thank you very much. <laughs>